Well, our seminar topics were on some church history figures. We did Thomas Aquinas and Calvin and Jonathan Edwards. We could have thrown in Augustine. We did also John Gershner, bringing the Reformed classical tradition right into the 20th century. So I'm going to throw this out to all of you. What is the value of the Reformed classical tradition for the church today? Well, I'll begin. Um, I think there's, there's at a number of levels, it's very helpful. Number one, especially in the West, and when I say in the West, I mean the American Evangelical Church, the damage of the Second Great Awakening, which I believe was the seeds were planted at the First Great Awakening, took us away from the confessional standards that may have been more common. And I don't know if people have appreciated, because if you see the trajectory from the subjectivism that was a part, that, that defined spirituality after the First Great Awakening. And so the trajectory goes from these Calvinistic churches, and everyone talks about the great Calvinistic preaching of Edwards and uh, ten, the tenets, but it was a subjectivism that was there so that true spirituality was not determined by your faith in the objective work of Christ, but in, in feelings. So this whole emphasis on feelings, which began a, a trend, so that by the time we get to the second great awakening, people forget that it was actually through a Presbyterian uh, revival, this, this sort of uh, communion revival that, that, that sparked the second great awakening. And that opened the door for a lot of unhealthy trends that came to now redefine American Protestantism, opening the door eventually for dispensational thinking and, and the whole bit, so that by the time we get into um, early 20th century, and I'm going to even go into uh, the, the, the rise of the charismatic movement the, the, uh, by 1960, so there's such a shift. And by the way, again, the charismatic revival or the charismatic movement actually has its genesis in the Episcopal Church. My point being, in spite of the denominational labels, the trends and shifts that were really defining American evangelicalism or American Protestantism was far from the confessions that they would have held to. So the Dutch Reformed presence in the early 20th century, the Presbyterian standards were, were not the dominant voices of Protestant, uh, the, of Protestant uh, Christianity here in America. And so I think one of the things that, and this is where R.C. was, I think, uh, a catalyst in reconnecting not just the historically confessional denominations, but defining Protestantism according to the, the, uh, the Reformers. So I think what, what the Reformed tradition does is it brings us back to the standards of the faith, and it brings us back to the, even with our various denominations, it defines the faith where the gospel begins to make sense. If we understand it in, in historic terms, it, it, it makes sense. So I think the resurgence that we've seen to whatever degree of reformational theology in American Protestantism has not only recovered a sense of, of faith and reason, but also uh, the objectivity of the gospel itself, if that makes sense. I was waiting for John to go next, but uh, I think, but he didn't, so I'll, I'll go. Um, I think one value of the classical reform tradition uh, to which Dr. Sproul adhered and for which he was such a great articulator uh, is the Catholicity uh, of the faith that is laid claim by that tradition. And by that, I don't mean big C Catholic in communion with the Pope of Rome, Catholicity, but 
kind of bread and butter, broad orthodoxy on doctrines like the incarnation and the Trinity, and even as we were speaking today about original sin, um, really laying claim to a Christian Orthodox heritage that is older than the Reformation. And I wanna say the Reformation itself did that. Uh, the question that Protestants had to answer very early on was where was your church before Luther? Um, how do we know that this isn't some kind of novel or newfangled sectarianism that you are introducing? And that was a, that was a real crisis that the early Reformation churches had to face. And the creedal and confessional tradition of the Reformed really were designed in part not only to say, here's how we're distinct from you, but also to say, here's what we're not changing at all. Um, and here are our broad ecumenical creed credentials um, on which we aren't compromising in the least. And I think that there's, I think sometimes the tendency for us nowadays is to look at our various doctrinal statements or confessions or creeds and to really camp out on those things that distinguish us, us into the narrowest sector possible. Perhaps if you held to the second London confession, you would emphasize excessively uh, church government and baptism and forget that that really is an, an in the best sense, an ecumenical and Catholic document really designed to demonstrate not just the particular distinctives of a group, but perhaps more overtly to emphasize the broad orthodoxy of the group. And I think that's one thing you get in R.C. Sproul is he brings in names uh, that aren't necessarily household names, and he, for many of us, made them household names, names like Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, uh, for which he has a, a fruitful appreciation. I think that really shows... Uh, the non-sectarian nature of reformational Christianity. Yeah, I, ditto, uh, and I, amen and amen. And the only thing I would add is I, I often think in pictures, and uh, I think it's because I, you know, I tell my wife I'm dim-witted, so I have to think in just you know kind of big kind of things. And so the way I illustrate it to my students <clears throat> is I think we often think of the Reformation as a breakaway branch from the church, and I would say no, Rome is the breakaway branch. We're on the main branch, and what we did is we reformed, we corrected certain doctrines and teachings, and so we are Catholic with a small c, as in one holy Catholic or one holy universal church. And so you have to make use of the wealth of the church. And, you know, James, James joked about this, that he said that I would provide the exegesis. We'll, we'll push him, okay? We'll make him do this too. But, you know, keep in mind when when, uh, when um, Paul says in Ephesians 4 that in the wake of Christ's ascension, he gave gifts to the church, and that some of those gifts are teachers and pastors, then that means that teachers in every age of the church are our gifts. And that means that Augustine, Tertullian, Aquinas, uh, Calvin, they're all ours. Uh, and so we can benefit from them, not blindly, critically, carefully, biblically. I had this, dis I had this described to me one time as the, the modern penchant for maverick Christianity. Do you remember that the maverick rode alone? Uh, and it's, it's a kind of mentality of me, my Bible, and the Holy Spirit, and that shall be enough for life and godliness. And it really omits the the important place of the church and the cloud of witnesses, which are those gifts given to the church. Uh, we reserve the right to test all things by Holy Scripture, um, and yet we're not the first to test things by Holy Scripture. And what I, what I appreciate about classical reformational Christianity is a, is a willingness and a humility to fruitfully enter into a theological um, examination and contemplation with the history of the church in those 1,500 years before it. Uh, and what I often find uh, is that, um, hey, they were right after all. Uh, kind of entering into their way of thinking, though, I think gives us a robust and muscular Christianity uh, for today. Thank you all. I want to go back and just ask a question of each of you related to your lectures that you gave us earlier. So for you, Reverend Jones, thank you for that on the sovereignty of God. Really appreciate how you brought that doctrine before us. Uh, many folks within the church wrestle sometimes with this notion of suffering and sovereignty. Could you just speak to that for a moment? 
Yeah, as I, <clears throat> excuse me, as I indicated in the message, the big picture is this. We live in a cursed creation. And God allows us to feel, however progressively, the fact that as good as things are or can be, it's not what it was created to be from the beginning. So suffering should be understood in the same category as sickness in general. The reason there is sickness is because there is sin. And the mistake is made sometimes that this sickness is because of this sin. No, the fact of sin is the reason for sickness. If there is no, sick, no sin, there's no sickness, and there, is no, there are no natural disturbances. So all of human suffering is really in response to the consequences of sin in general, not sin in particular. And I think we, I, I want to make that known over and over again because what we'll do is we'll say, we'll look at one particular situation and try to identify a particular sin as being the cause of it. But the reason for suffering is because of the fact of sin. And all suffering is in response to either physical or natural responses or, or consequences of the curse. So therefore, under God's sovereignty, because he did not eliminate the human race the day Adam sinned, he allows him to exist in, to some degree. And when I say him, I mean all of humanity in him and then as we experience it individually. He allows us to experience the consequences of sin as he heads towards that, that, that twofold eschatological purpose, the ultimate condemnation of wicked and the ultimate redemption of those that he's called. So therefore, suffering is going to be with us to some degree until the final act of judgment and until the renewal and the consummation of our, of our redemption. So there, there's always going to be that consequence. And I, it, there, there's, we suffer, and, and even, even in death, you know, we, we suffer. We, uh, I like what Paul says to the Thessalonians, talking about responding to the death of a believer, that we don't sorrow as those who are without hope but we still sorrow, you know, because death, death stings. There is a sting that's attached to death, even with the knowledge of, of redemption, even with the knowledge of the resurrection. Death stings because it was intended to sting, and it's to the degree that we understand the consequences of the curse and what it's leading to that those that he calls to salvation in time, we now have a greater grasp. Jonathan Edwards says, God makes, before God makes men mindful of his mercy, he makes them mindful of their misery. And so suffering is with us until the consummation. But in that unfolding of redemption, and that progressive unfolding of the coming condemnation, we will suffer. But the good news for those who are in Christ is that our suffering, the end of our suffering, is the consummation of God's grace in Christ. The end of the suffering for those who are not in Christ is a greater degree of condemnation. Dr. Dolezal, is there a genuine conviction of sin is cosmic treason in the church today? In some places, yes. <laughs> uh, perhaps in some places, not. Uh, I, think one, I think one concern that we could raise about that uh, is a tendency to 
portray sin primarily in terms of how it affects and hurts us and in our relationships. And that's undoubtedly true. The reason that that is preached and makes sense is because we all experience that. Um, Adam and Eve were the first to experience the effects of sin on human relations, uh, even among themselves. And so I don't discount that, but I think there's the concern I have is that there's almost a, a, a predominant horizontal perspective with regard to sin is primarily that which hurts me and hinders my relationships. Uh, and I think sometimes you hear this, and I need to be very careful saying this, but sometimes you hear this in the language of sin as brokenness, um, which is undoubtedly true but needs qualification, um, it, because brokenness can some, if brokenness is kind of isolated as the main thing that's bad about sin, it can perhaps, it doesn't have to, con convey the idea that we are these kind of passive victims of sin. And I think that's the concern I have sometimes is that we still talk about sin, but we talk about sin as if it's something outside of us for which we're not guilty and it does a lot of bad things to us. And there's this kind of, we're the victims of something else when in reality it's, it's our sin and it's our culpability and high-handedness. I think the cosmic dimension is also somewhat eclipsed concurrent with the eclipse of a rich understanding of the holiness and the attributes of God. When we lose sight of the transcendence of God, of the absoluteness of His character, some of the attributes that were mentioned even earlier this morning and in some of the seminars, things like God's self-sufficiency or aseity, um, His simplicity, a strange doctrine, but one that, that needs uh, a second wind big time, uh, doctrines like divine impassibility, which sound really odd to modern evangelical ears. These are all doctrines that are designed to spotlight the otherness and the transcendence and the grandeur of the, of the divine being of the creator-creature distinction. As we have sort of eroded the creator-creature distinction, sin as cosmic treason starts to get muted or perhaps lost to view. So I think there's, there's an aspect of this that isn't about homardiology proper, which is the doctrine of sin. It's really a, a, a loosening up in our doctrine of God that has a concurrent effect in our doctrine of sin. And so we begin to think more horizontally about sin than we do vertically. Um, I think a, a return to a classical doctrine of God would bring a return to a strong emphasis upon sin as cosmic treason sort of in its wake. Dr. Fesco, you said that you like to think in pictures, and I now have a picture in my mind of a car going down the road with an evangelical and a Catholic and kumbaya and justification gagged in the trunk. I, I will never, I'll never forget that image as, so long as I live. Uh, you talked about, thank you, you talked about evangelicals, that's not my question. Um, here's my question. You talked about evangelicals and Catholics together, and Dr. Sproul's courageous stand cost him friendships that moment. Since then, many evangelicals have embraced the so-called new perspective on Paul. And uh, just to give you a quick moment here, uh, what is the new perspective on Paul? It goes back to the late 70s uh, when a scholar by the name of James Dunn wrote an article uh, and then shortly thereafter, another scholar that you may or may not have heard of, his name is N.T. Wright, uh, he wrote an article, and it, the article is called Paul, The Paul of Faith versus the Paul of History. And large in part, he says that the Paul that we have, uh, that we understand, for example, in the Reformed tradition, in the Reformed confessions, is one of faith. In other words, we've kind of created him. It, that's not the real Paul. The real Paul, the Paul of History, is one that uh, doesn't talk about the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And in fact, he says that while he does mention imputation, he says it's a sidelight in Paul's argument in Romans 4, and it's not the main point that Protestants have over-exaggerated and have, you know, taken to extremes. And what ultimately they say is that we have um, mischaracterized first-century Judaism by saying that they're all legalists, and that first century Judaism, the Pharisees, the, the, the faith of the Jews, they were, they were about grace. And he, you know, has at least historically claimed that, you know, there, there, there were no Pelagians in, in, in first century Judaism. 
But in all of that, and so that's why he says that it's not about, they're not about works righteousness. They, of course, believe in grace, and, but the way that it goes about is in by grace, stay in by works, is the overall argument. Now, I'm s simplifying a lot. There's a lot of details to the puzzle. But what, what my, 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 my problem with all of this, and there are many, many scholars uh, on, re on the record on this, and there's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, books and articles that have been written, is that nobody has ever really been worried too much about Pelagius. It was Charles Hodge who said the, the, the ghost that haunts the church is the ghost of semi-Pelagius. In other words, you have to be a pretty, you know, pretty uh, crazy person to say, yeah, Jesus is necessary, maybe. He's kind of optional. You don't really need him. You can get by on your own. You really got to go out on a limb to say that. That's why there are so few heretics like Pelagius. The bigger problem in the church is semi-Pelagianism saying that it's you and Jesus, whereas the historic teaching of the scriptures as we've codified it in our confessions and, you know, saints throughout the ages have heralded is that, no, it's all Jesus. You know, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so, long story short, when you look at the way he describes semi or, uh, the first century Judaism, it looks an awful lot alike medieval Roman Catholicism. And so did Luther and the reformers get every single detail about first century Judaism correct? No, they could use some improvements here and there. Did they get the gospel right? I think absolutely. Uh, and so that, that, that's in a, in a nutshell what, what the new perspective on Paul is. Let, let me just add one thing. When you mentioned semi-Pelagianism, semi remember R.C. always said that's Pelagius' first cousin. <laughs> and I want to thank you, too, for taking us to Zechariah chapter 3. That, that was uh, very Sproul-esque and uh, loved the drama of the text, and there is truly drama there illustrating for us imputation. Thank you for that. We have a few moments here uh, to close, and uh, I'd like all of you to just maybe think about a particular book of Dr. Sproul's that um, you would um, like to commend and that you found influential and helpful in your own walk. I'm going to take the classics off the table. So I'm going to take classical apologetics off the table. I know that might be hard for both of you and all three of you. Uh, I'm going to take holiness of God off the table. That's hard for everyone. I'll take chosen by God off the table for you, Reverend Jones, since that was part of your talk. So let's take those three off the table. There's still about 98 left for you to choose from. Which one? I'm going to say two. That's one, okay. You can do that. Okay. We'll let you. The Priest with Dirty Clothes, which is based on the Zechariah passage, and it's for children. And that that to me is, is very helpful because so much of evangelical writing for children, it's childish and it's not Christ-centered. So this is doctrine at a child's level, and I love that. But the other one is, now that's a good question because it's a book of questions and answers that RC has had over the years, and it's uh, helpful to usually, if, if you read through it, and you deal with unbelievers or, or people who are wrestling with different issues uh, in the church, probably a question or one related to it is covered in that book. And R.C. just kind of, in his own way, answers these different questions about the faith or to the faith, and I think it's good to have on hand uh, to, to reference some of the questions that people deal with. I think that's great you mentioned that book. I remember Vesta saying when they founded the, the study center, they wanted it to be a place where people could come with questions and get real answers. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Fesco? There's a lot to choose from, obviously, but I guess one of the ones that sticks out most in my mind is Justification by Faith Alone, which was kind of right on the heels of ECT. Um, and not only does it uh, bear Dr. Sproul's characteristic clarity, and if I can use an old word, perspicacity, you know, just the clearness with which he, he would teach and speak and write. But he also introduced me to one of my all-time favorites in that book, Francis Turretin, 
and just with the, the razor-sharp distinctions that Turretin makes, that he had a little chart in there in that book talking about the instrumental cause, the material cause, the final cause, uh, the formal cause of justification. It just brought so much clarity. And when I teach the doctrine of justification to my students, uh, I, I always use that same, you know, uh, that same heuristic device of material, formal, final, and uh, instrumental cause just to help them see where exactly Rome and uh, we Protestants differ on the doctrine of justification. And so that to me, I think, is perhaps one of my favorites, if not maybe the favorite, but I know there's so many others to compete, so that's where I'll, I'll put mine on that, on that book. Great, thank you. I'm gonna say two as well. Uh, the first one, The Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, uh, and what I liked about that book is just the brevity of it. Almost every chapter in the book is two pages in length. Uh, maybe three on a rare occasion, uh, and it's, it's not just my short attention span, but it's that the space constraints force him to use crisp and tight language on a wide range of theological topics, and if you were introducing the faith to a high school or college student who really needed to be brought in on a broad range of Christian doctrines uh, with real luminosity and Scripture to back it up. Um, the Essential Truths of the Christian Faith is one that is very helpful. I think in addition to that, because Reverend Jones picked two, so I'll pick two, The Invisible Hand, uh, which is his book on divine providence. And Reverend Jones talked about divine concurrence this morning. Uh, a, very, a very important aspect of divine providence is how God works in the work of creatures, uh, so that it's not a question of is it God or is it the creature, but it really is a both and working in distinct ways and in non-equal ways in every action. I can admit that my, I've wrestled with that myself uh, over the years and found that book very clear on the historic doctrine of concurrence. How does God work in the work of creatures while still respecting the genuineness of their activity, the invisible hand on divine providence? You know, we, we've been talking about the books here of Dr. Sproul, and for many folks, this is how they come to know Dr. Sproul, through renewing your mind, through the books. And when you read his books, you feel like you know him. Uh, for one, he has so many personal stories, Invisible Hand uh, has so many stories within it. Uh, but you folks also had the opportunity to, to spend time with Dr. Sproul. So as our final question here, uh, just if you have a, a memory of, a, of, of or an anecdote of a, just a time that you spent with Dr. Sproul that you'd like to share with everyone. I guess I, I can start again. Um, it would be, it would be just his his role as as a bridge. I went to my first Legionnaire conference in 1990, and the following year, prior to going to the conference, I was invited by someone on the Legionnaire staff to a luncheon. And this was the conference was held down in San Diego, and I was invited to a conference. Uh, or a luncheon in preparation for the conference. And <clears throat> the, per, um, the person that invited me wanted me to meet someone. And the person they wanted me to meet was Michael Horton. And so I went to the luncheon. This is in May of like 1990 or 91. And so I met Mike and the next week I get a phone call from Mike to come and spend some time with him. He was filling in with a guy, for a guy named Greg Kokel who had a radio program in Southern California. So we spent four hours on the air together after having met to just change phone numbers. And we became friends. And then one thing that happened with, with Horton is he, ha he was teaching a theology class in Linwood, which Linwood, California, which is right next to uh, Compton. And so I went to go hear him teach theology in this area. And I'm like, okay, this guy's for real. And so we, we just bonded, and from there, R.C. took us on. And I remember the first year, I mean, he embraced us as a patron. The first year that I spoke at a Legionnaire conference, I, I did a, um, 
a, a breakout session. And, but the opening night, I was asked to introduce RC. And this is 96, I think. And so the, this, this span from being just a, an attendant at a, at a conference to now introducing RC, I was just overwhelmed. So I, I introduced him and I'm about to walk off the platform after I presented him and he calls me back and he puts his arm around my shoulder and he says, how many of you guys listen to Renewing Your Mind? And all the hands went up. How many of you listen to um, White War Sin? Only a few hands went up. Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, and how many of you read Table Talk? All the hands went up. How many read Modern Reformation? Only a few hands went up. Shame on you. And, and then he goes on to plug the White Horse Inn, Modern Reformation, and the next day, uh, I, they, they said, Ken, what, what happened? You know, the, the next week we're getting all these calls at Cure, the, the Cure Office, Cure, Christians United for Reformation, and RC really stood as our patron. Uh, Michael Horton, who I think is the, one of the foremost uh, Reformed theologians of this generation, I know uh, James Boyce was significant, with him personally, but with me personally, it was RC for me, and then what he also did in opening the door for the younger guys that were coming on, he gave room for, uh, to us, he gave acceptance to us, even as we went in our own ways. So I just, I was never, once I met him, I was never a stranger to him. And I, and I appreciate that. So there was, a, there was a bond. Sometimes people just have public relationships, but he had a commitment to what we were connected to, and he demonstrated that publicly. My one story, I guess, spans a couple of decades, and you know, I can summarize it as succinctly as possible, is that I felt like when I was going through seminary, I didn't have a mentor. And uh, in fact, most of my professors were hostile to the Reformed faith. Uh, and so I considered Dr. Sproul a mentor to me. Uh, I would listen to his tapes, uh, you know, audio cassettes. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, and these weren't just the conference tapes or the popular stuff, or the, the well-known stuff. These were like the history of theology, the history of philosophy. These were the, you know, the old ones, I think, back from the Ligonier Valley. And so I felt like I just knew him so well. I would be in the library as a janitor in seminary, listening to Dr. Sproul three to four hours a night, five days a week. And then I'd run out, you know, call home, need more money, send tapes, um, you know, and, and they'd, they'd send them in. And so, it, but it wasn't just through the tapes, you know, I would write to him and I'd say, I know you're gonna be in town. Any chance that you can, you know, meet for a meal? And he took the time to meet with me and my friends I didn't eat that morning because I, I didn't have the money for the, the, for the buffet because it was, uh, it was too expensive. Uh, but my friends ate and then didn't pay. <laughs> and I was like, you guys, I think you just stiffed Dr. Sproul. <laughs> I, I, I hope that he didn't have to pay for that. You know, I was like, I'm clean because I, I didn't eat anything. Uh, but then I was getting ready to go to grad school. I wrote to him. I said, is there any possibility I could talk to you on the phone and, and ask you some advice? He took the time out of his busy schedule to talk to me on the phone for, for like 45 minutes. And that's where, again, you know, I, I can't do as good a voice as, as Ken did, but in his, you know, his, his gruff voice, you know, he's like, you know, pack Turretin, make sure you pack Turretin. I was like, oh, it's already packed. You know, it, it's going to be in there. You know, but so I just, over the years, he wasn't just at a distance, but, you know, from time to time, he would take that time to, you know, to, 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 to reach out personally and, and to, to connect. Even when I did a D-Min seminar for, uh, for um, I guess it was for Ligonier when they had their D-Min, he and his wife took me out to dinner and, you know, they treated me so kindly and were so encouraging. But in all of that, not only does it always teach me to try to, in a sense, fly as high as I can to learn as much as I can, to, but stay on the ground too and to try to, to, to connect with everybody and anybody uh, and, and, and to laugh along the way. Uh, one last, you know, anecdote, I was at a conference and I said, hey, Dr. Sproul, have you ever thought of uh, maybe, uh, you know, starting a, a school where you would have a degree and you would call it a defensor fide or something like that? And his, in his, his unique way, he said, young man, did, 
did God or Satan encourage you to ask that question? <laughs> and I, I was terrified. I was like, well, uh, I mean, God, I hope. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> So, so that collection of stories, it was just, you know, it's just, he was always that way. And so uh, it encourages me to, to learn, to pass on the truth to others, and to laugh along the way. Maybe to that note, uh, my own personal interaction, briefly 20 years ago at a conference uh, where he gave me some encouraging words, uh, and then a few years ago, just before he passed away, uh, he invited me down, and he and Vesta, Mrs. Sproul, took me out to dinner, and it was, I was told that I needed to be there at 5 p.m. sharp. Dr. Tweedale ensured that I was there at 5 p.m. sharp, and that this might not be a, a terribly long meal, given that he needed to rest and his physical condition at the time. And we did sit down at 5 p.m. sharp, and uh, I, I was, I'll admit that I was a bit intimidated. Um, I had grown, you, you cut your teeth on his cassette tapes, and I cut mine on his VHS tapes, uh, uh, you know, Wednesday night at the church in the summertime when R.C. was the Wednesday night Bible teacher on VHS, and somebody had to adjust the tracking. Do you remember, tra some of you will never know what tracking is, but uh, getting, R getting the tracking right on the R.C. Uh, VHS, uh, and being taught the great truths of the faith the history of the faith, uh, the, biblical, the biblical foundations of the faith as a college student watching the newly minted Dust to Glory uh, lectures, which are really, if you don't know Dust to Glory, uh, a high altitude walk through the entirety of the Scriptures during COVID. I've been watching that on DVD with our family. Uh, during the lockdown, we were locked down with R.C., uh, which was uh, a real blessing to us. I sat down for 5 p.m. and thought, this is going to be a short meal. Don't overburden him. There was no hope of it that night. We did not walk out of the restaurant until after 8 p.m. It, it was a full three hours, and maybe to echo Reverend Jones and, and Dr. Fesco, there was just a great generosity of spirit uh, I had written some things. Uh, we, had a, we both had a mutual love for classical theism. Uh, during vast sections of Dr. Sproul's public career, there were times when he stood relatively alone uh, in his adherence to classical theism, and particularly his penchant for Thomas Aquinas. Uh, it was one that um, eventually I, I came to appreciate as well, and it was, it was really encouraging to see his enthusiasm, even to the very end, uh, for these great truths of the, of the faith, and particularly for the transcendence and the majesty of God, which were enshrined in those doctrines and in that teaching. Um, it was also a time of just uh, free discourse. We found that we had a, a several, several mutual uh, sources that we, enjoy, that we learned from in common. And to, uh, and to really find a camaraderie of spirit on that. But there was no, this is what really was exhibited. Uh, for a person who touched so many lives, there was quite evidently not a jealousy for pride of place, but a real willingness to, to welcome and encourage the work of, of others who had no name and no pedigree, uh, who were trying to faithfully speak the truth as God had given it to us. Uh, to be a real encourager of that was a, was a legacy, I think, that probably many could stand and attest to. I'm glad to attest to it myself. I've heard that dinner described by others as two guys high-fiving each other for three hours. So that's what happened there. And it all does arc back to the doctrine of God, doesn't it, when we're talking about R.C. Sproul. Well, could you join with me in thanking our speakers for today? <laughs>